Today's online lesson is going to reflect the information from chapter 24, which is measuring the cost of living. Before we get into the actual material, the actual content, I'd like to show you a couple of graphs to illustrate the difference and distinction between different parts of the country and the cost of living. Here I have a, a graph of uh, southeast Florida, where I grew up, in the Miami-Fort Lauderdale metropolitan area, where I spent most of my life. In southeast Florida, the median home price in 2013 currently is $172,000. And you can see that this is different, of course, between other parts of Florida. Uh, for instance, Tampa is $128,000. Uh, Orlando, the metro Orlando area, is, is a little bit more than that, $146,000. But nonetheless, this uh, illustration of the various median home sale prices gives us an indication of how living in different parts of Florida can actually be more or less expensive. Now, taking a look at the distinction between Florida and Georgia, here I have a graph of southeast Georgia. In, a, in and surrounding Brunswick, around Glen Academy, would be about 115000 Out where I live, off of 82, is a little more, around 140000 And you can see some of the various median home prices that exist in this area that we live in. So, the point of this is to show you that within a state or state to state, there can be a tremendous distinction between the cost of living in one place and the cost of living in another place. And the cost of living is essentially what does it take me to survive, to live in a particular area and based on what I'm used to living like. Here's another map which shows you the cost of housing around the country. And you can see that the pockets of red are going to be the more expensive places to live. And generally, you can see that this is along coastal areas, be it California, Washington, New York, South Florida, um, maybe even some of the interior areas of Colorado or what have you. But nonetheless, the cost of living is going to differ based on a lot of different factors, but housing would be certainly be one of them. So the cost of living is the amount of money that is needed to survive including things such as housing, food, you know, health care, taxes, whatever it is, these will differ from state to state and even locally based on where you live. The cost of living will change. So this chapter looks at the cost of living and measuring the cost of living. When I was a kid, I used to collect comic books. It was just something I enjoyed doing and me and my brothers would, would get into it and it, at the time was actually a pretty um, popular thing in society. It's become less popular as media and technology have changed, but back in the 80s and 90s, early 90s, I guess you could say, it was a really popular thing. So I have an issue here of a comic book that I used to have called Gru the Wanderer. It was my, one of my favorite comics. The very first issue of Gru that was released back in 1985 sold for 75 cents. So we fast forward to 2012 and the Amazing Spider-Man number 700 sells for $7.99. Okay, so what is this? Why did this happen? What am I trying to illustrate? See, back in 1985, a comic could cost you $0.75, cents, whereas today it could cost you almost $8. The moral of this story is that prices go up over time. This concept is illustrated by the concept of something known as inflation. Inflation is a general and sustained increase in price levels. And over time, when we see prices go up, whether it's for comic books or for cheeseburgers or for whatever, this causes our money to hold less value. And if our money holds less value, then it can buy less. So inflation is an increase in a percentage from one time to another in the price levels in an economy. Not just the price of one thing, but all prices. We measure the percentage change based on what we call the inflation rate. Now you've already learned one index called the GDP deflator, which showed us how inflation goes up and down over time, or prices go up and down over time. In this lesson or this chapter, we're going to look at the second of the in indexes known as consumer price index. Anyway, inflation. Prices go up. This happens. We know this happens. So a normal healthy rate of inflation about 2 to 3 percent. In fact, if you look at the United States from 1914 to more current times, the average rate of inflation was about 3.38 percent. 
So economists, most economists say and argue that a normal, healthy rate of inflation is about 2 to 3%. Here's a couple other terms you need to know. When prices go rapidly out of control, they highly inflate. We call this hyperinflation. The most recent example of this would be in Zimbabwe, which in 2000, the late 2000s, saw their currency actually die. Zimbabwe basically printed their currency to the point where it was no longer accepted internationally. Another term is called disinflation. Disinflation is when the prices go up, but they go up at a slower rate. So this is a slowdown in the price levels in the economy. We also have what's called deflation. Deflation is typically what makes economists really nervous because that's indicative of economic decline and contraction. So when price levels actually drop, we call this deflation. And finally, we have what's called stagflation. Stagflation is effectively when prices go up, but the economy contracts. This is a combination of probably two of the worst things that could happen. Again, a contracting economy yet increasing price levels. The most common example of this, or we will use in this class to refer to, is the 1973 energy crisis, which we'll talk more about in class. But it was at this time which we had an embargo placed on us by the Middle Eastern OPEC nations, which caused the United States economy to highly contract, while at the same time driving up the price of fuel and other uh, products that are based on the gas as an intermediate product. Now, why does inflation happen? There are effectively three theories to this. The first is called the quantity theory. Too much money, prices go up. In other words, you've got too much currency out there in the economy. If this happens, then you're going to have too, many, too much money chasing too few goods, and this is going to cause inflation. So in theory, ideally, the money supply should grow at the same rate of GDP. Theory number two, demand pull. We call this theory the demand pull theory, and this is a lot of what we talked about with supply and demand. Remember with supply and demand that if we saw a shift to the right in the demand curve, it pulled prices up. Well, this example that we're looking at here would be the price of just one product. But in our economy, if we, saw, if we see demand increase for all products, and we'll talk more about what that is later, you're going to see general price levels increase. So the demand pull theory relies on the theory of, of supply and demand, where demand shifts to the right causes increase in price levels. The final theory to why prices go up is called the cost push theory. With the cost push theory, we're also looking at supply and demand. And if you recall from class, when the cost of running a business increases, supply will decrease. So anything that becomes more expensive for a business is going to shift the curve to the left, effectively pushing the price of products in the market up. And so with the cost push theory, we're saying that the supply is shifting to the left for some product, and this is causing an increase in the price and the price levels in an economy. So whether it is the quantity theory, demand pull, or cost push, there are three basic theories to why prices go up. We'll talk more about this in class, and you can proceed to the quiz.